Morning, everybody. Um, if you have a Bible, could you turn to the beginning of John's Gospel? Uh, we are beginning a series today in John's Gospel, yes. Um, so we're going to look at the first 18 verses of chapter 1, which I shall read in just a moment. I need to do, just need to do a few domestics, just so I don't stand on a microphone later on. Uh, and hello again, if you are uh, tuning in at home, I hope you don't have too much difficulty finding a Bible either. I'm going to be looking at John's Gospel, chapter 1, going to read the first 18 verses. Here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, We've all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. I have to cast my mind back to, uh, to Rachel and I getting engaged and then married. And then after a couple of years... Um, Rachel was pregnant with our, our first baby girl, and um, we got home one evening and discovered that we had been burgled uh, while, we'd been, while, we'd, while we had been out. Um, maybe someone had noticed our, our rhythm, our routine, and, um, and, and broken into our house. Sometimes we did leave it a little bit untidy, but this was something else. Every room, every drawer, every cupboard had been like rifled through. Things just tipped out on the floor. Um, a bit like Jules encountering that road traffic accident, this split second that kind of walked through the door. This is different. And um, the, the, the shock just meant, I suppose, that we thought, well, let's, let's go and stay at a friend's house. We stayed at a friend's house that night, uh, had a chat with uh, the police the next day. And we were a bit shaken um, for, for a day or so. In, 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 in my wisdom, I suggested to take our minds off of it all, that we would go to the cinema, okay? I had no idea what films were on. It it wasn't like there was anything as massive as like James Bond, the wait is over, if you've been to see the James Bond film recently, or or something else. Uh, It was just one of those quiet, I don't even know when it happened, what time of year it was, but it was almost like one of those quiet times at the cinema. Um, There was no massive blockbuster, so we we were in the lobby of Cineworld, And we were making the decision there what film to watch. I have now learned, we've now learned, that is not the best way to make a decision about what film to watch. We were looking for something funny, escapist, light and fluffy. And and I saw saw a film there, I thought, look, that film, it's got Reese Witherspoon in it. I'm not going to mention the film by now. It's got Reese Witherspoon. She's funny. Right, you like Reese Witherspoon? Let's go and watch this film. Oh my 
word. Now, it was maybe an 18 certificate. No, it wasn't an 18. It was a 15. Was it a 15? It was a 15. This sermon will be a PG. You're quite all right. Um, so we've gone, we've gone to see this film and then, and then realized, if I had been a little bit more attuned to current affairs at the time, I may have read the title of this film in a completely different light. Um, it's just the most traumatic film we have ever watched. <laughs> and uh, roughly halfway through, with our eyes like wide open, uh, uh, realizing my mistake, uh, the mistake was obviously mine, um, lent to Rachel, shall we just go? Shall we leave? Uh, Rachel said, we can't leave now. We've got to make sure that everyone's okay, <laughs> that it all resolved. I don't think you could entirely say that it resolved happily ever after, but it, it did resolve. We, we survived the experience. Maybe in some strange way it did take our minds off our own recent trauma uh, when we saw that film. And uh, what that has revealed to us, what that reminded me of this week, is just how helpful it can be to watch a trailer. Because in the trailer, it's like you get introduced to the film in just two and a half minutes. So it's, it's not a great cost in terms of your time. But if you watch the film, the, the trailer will help you to work out what is this story. And, and for us in that experience, is that the film that we really want to go and see? Uh, reading through these first few verses of John's Gospel, it's called a prologue, and you might think, well, what on earth is one of those? And you can read some, uh, some commentaries that were maybe written a few years ago and say, oh, it's like the foyer of a building, and it doesn't really sound that exciting either. The prologue, it's like watching a trailer. John, in writing his Gospel, wants to give us um, the flavor of what's coming up in the whole piece. He's purposely wanting to put out some hooks that will draw us in. If someone makes a trailer, you know, they, they make some serious money for just two and a half minutes of, of introduction to a film. They're using every, everything in the book they can think of, the, the soundtrack. Maybe there'll be some big words that come up on the screen. You'll see some of the action. You won't see all of it. It's, it's, it's designed to think, wow. This is an amazing story, and we're going to go and see it. We're going to get involved. We're going to go, we're going to, we're going to go and watch it. And, and I think they're doing a number of things. So here is, here is John, and in these verses, he is giving us his trailer, his introduction. And there's a, there's a few things that he's doing. First of all, what John is doing is setting the scene. Setting the scene for the good news in Jesus that he is going to share with everybody throughout the ages who reads or listens to this uh, amazing book. It's going to set the scene. It's going to give the big picture so that as we go through, we can understand as the details emerge what's happening and how to understand ourselves in it. This happens in, in trailers all the time. Okay, Maybe it's a film about Spider-Man, or maybe even it's a film about Batman. Yeah, and at some point in the trailer, you just know there'll be this big wide angle shot of Gotham City. Well, it's kind of New York, but let's call it Gotham City. This is where the story is set. This is where the action takes place. And this is who the story was affecting. People living there in Gotham. Come with me, as it were, to Gotham City. So you get this big, wide shot. And often gospel writers will do that in, in setting the scene. Um, uh, Matthew will go all the way back and will say, look, here, here Mary and Joseph getting together. And this great, amazing story that unfolds from the time that Jesus was born goes all the way back to Jesus' birth. Um, Mark does something similar. He doesn't go all the way back, um, but he goes right back to the, uh, of, of Jesus' life, but he goes back to the very beginning of his ministry. 
Here's the good news about Jesus Christ, Son of God. And then he talks about John the Baptist, different John, and how John prepared the way for Jesus. And then we meet Jesus. We see Jesus baptized and starting his ministry. And maybe Luke thinks, I've got to go back a bit further. I mean, he, he goes back further than the manger. He goes all the way back um, to before Jesus and John the Baptist was born and we see what's happening in the temple. We meet a few people there. In fact, in a way, he goes even further back than that. And he talks about where Jesus has come from. And he gives a big, um, he lists through all the, all the names, all the descendants, and he traces it all the way back. You can see how Jesus came not just from Abraham, but from Adam. So if you're Luke, you're thinking, I need to go back all the way to Adam, all the way to creation. John goes back further still, not just to the creation of the world, but all the way back to these words, in the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. He's dangling a hook. For anyone who knew the Hebrew scriptures, immediately those three words, in the beginning, take you back before creation. Before the universe existed, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. That's what was in the beginning. And so because John knows that, he's saying, in the beginning was the Word. Do you remember how uh, the account of creation began? With God speaking. God said, let there be light. And so a Jewish audience would know God's powerful Word created the universe. God spoke. And now John's wanting to say, and here's a bit more that you can understand. And when you're hearing about Jesus, I want you to understand that the Jesus who came and became a part of history was the Word who was with God in the beginning. This powerful agent with God who is God and created the universe, created all things. And for those who weren't from a Jewish background but had more of a, a Greek education. They would be familiar with this word in the Bible, uh, the word, the Greek word logos. This sense it was more distant for them, this unknown God or divine principle, impersonal, was responsible for creating the world. And so John would be saying to them, I, I want you to know a bit more about how the world came to be. This logos, this word, is not some impersonal force. We meet him in Jesus. You see, John starts where lots of us might finish. He, he wants us to know from the very beginning, Jesus is God. Jesus, the Son of God, he, he exists before the universe existed. He was there in the beginning, uncreated, always there. Um, uh, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, it says in, this, in verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who's at the Father's side, Jesus has made him known. Jesus reveals God to us. That's where we might conclude the story. Jesus is God. I rest my case. The end. Close the book. Maybe that's how some of us who know God, who walk with Jesus, think about evangelism. I'm going to get to know someone, I'm going to make friends, I'm going to share my faith, I'll dangle a few hooks into conversation, I hope they ask me a few questions, I might start talking about church, what I did at the weekend, I might talk about a little bit of my testimony, and eventually, eventually we'll get to the really big news, right at the very end, I'll be able to explain, Jesus is God. And that's where we might finish. 
It's, it's called kind of friendship evangelism. Softly, softly, softly. Years of investment. Long term. Building up connection. One day I'll be able to make it clear. Boom. Jesus is God. And maybe sometimes we should start a bit more like John. It's utterly provoking. It's confrontational. It's, that's where he starts. If you want to make sense of my life, you know that I believe Jesus is God. <laughs> I believe that Jesus laid down his life. I, do, I believe that God came in the flesh and lived amongst us. We can know him through the word and we can know him by the spirit and he's alive and he's living right now. I'm not ruling out ever those occasions for the softly, softly, pray over the years, keep sowing, keep plugging away. But our faith can be more provocatively put about who Jesus is. Let's start there. John is laying his cards out on the table straight away. This is the way to understand the good news of Jesus. And if you don't get this, you won't get it. It's the key ingredient, the key thing to understand. Jesus is God amongst us. That's how he puts it later on in verse 14. The Word, the one who was there and created all things, the king of the universe, he became flesh. He took on our flesh. And, and John doesn't ignore that. We, we see through John's gospel, we'll see Jesus do some very human things. Jesus wept, for example. We see him in his humanity, but we need to understand he is God. He made his dwelling among us. The Almighty God pitched his tent on this planet so that when people saw Jesus, they'd seen, what, they'd seen God. When Jesus spoke, when Jesus did something... People were hearing God, and they were seeing God amongst them. And maybe for the disciples, it was a, a journey of discovery, a journey of understanding. Eventually, they would come to understand it. But now, when years have passed, before this particular disciple passes away, he puts it in these blunt terms. It's a stark Confrontation. That's how we're to, to read and understand it. And maybe that's how our life is to be. Our life is to be like a two and a half minute trailer for this amazing story of a real God who came amongst us in Jesus, now present by his spirit, whom we can know and be in relationship with. So there we are. John is setting the scene. What else does a trailer do? a movie trailer, uh, will introduce the characters. Not all of them. Not every single character that we're going to meet in John's Gospel. There isn't time to do that. This is just two and a half minutes. Well, about 25, to be honest. But um, this is just a kind of brief introduction. So what's John going to do? He's going to, he's going to land on some particular characters whom he wants to introduce. Obviously, in a way, he's done that with Jesus Christ, the Word, who's always been with God at the Father's side. He also introduces uh, one other person in particular. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He's not talking about himself. The John who's writing this gospel describes himself a bit more vaguely, just the disciple that Jesus loved. That's how he kind of includes himself in the gospel later on. So when he just says the word John, he means John the Baptist. He just doesn't say the Baptist. He's talking about John, a prophet sent from God who was point, whose, whose role was to point to Jesus. He would come, he baptized people. He had an amazing ministry. It says at the beginning of Mark's gospel, like the whole Judean countryside and everyone from Jerusalem went out to listen to him. Not necessarily, not meaning every single individual, but just saying that his ministry was massive. It was widespread. Not just 
urban Jerusalem dwellers, but people from countryside all over Israel, people had heard about. This is before Instagram, this is before Facebook and WhatsApp, this is before YouTube, this is before hybrid meetings, it's before, it's before the printing press, for goodness sake. You know, word spread. There's this guy called John, and we think God has sent him. He's got this amazing message, this amazing ministry. People were flocking to him and getting right with God as a result. They were baptized, getting baptized to confess their sins, saying, I'm not right with God. I need to get right with God. Whatever happens right now, I'm going to get right with God. Go on then, in the Jordan, in you go, really wet, back out again. Right, live differently. Turn away from your sin. He had this, this massive ministry. And I think in some respect, that's why he's being included here. Why? Because John the Baptist could easily be mistaken for the hero of the story. Just think about it for a moment. His ministry was that massive. Consider this as well when you go to the book of Acts, chapter 19. This is years after Jesus' death and resurrection. This is... Uh, Paul has now been a believer for some time and he's traveled to loads of different places away from Israel. And he arrives in a place called Ephesus. And so you see at the beginning of Acts chapter 19, I went to Ephesus and it says, uh, partway through verse 1, there he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He thought they were disciples of Jesus. They answered, No. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Paul is puzzled. Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So can you see that John the Baptist was something of a hero? News spread years later, hundreds of miles away. People were still aware of John the Baptist. So this is the gospel writer saying, look, he, he is a special guy. He's a big deal. He was massively used by God. But don't miss the point. For some, he would be regarded as this kind of real cultural, prophetic hero. But understand why God sent him. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, the light that came through Jesus. So that through him, through John the Baptist, all men might believe, if only. That was the purpose of his ministry. Many people did come to believe in Jesus if they'd heard John the Baptist, but not everybody um, made that step. So he came as a witness. He was, his role was to point to someone else. His role was to point to Jesus. And we'll see that unfold in these next three chapters of John. A witness, one pointing to the light. Lots of people do that. Lots of different, that happens in lots of different ways through John's gospel. Someone or, someone or something is in effect pointing to Jesus, saying, he's the one. He's the one in which we put our faith. We are drawn in so many different ways to find a cultural hero. Oh, if only I could be like, fill in that gap. If only I could be like Marcus Rashford. A new hero, I came across a new hero yesterday, sitting down watching Strictly Come Dancing for the first time. Forgive me, I know not everyone watches it. You don't have to. But my, my new hero is, is Reef Stevenson. CBBC presenter, just legend, amazing dancer. He did get a 10 last night, didn't he? Yeah, let's find out what happens. I'm sorry, so sorry. All you need to know is he did a good dance. Other people did a good dance too. No spoiler alerts here. But I might mention some other films later as well. Um, just amazing, the guy rocked. And, you know, when they're doing a the little interview, he, they're you know, he introduces his family, and they're lovely you know, the personal story, and he introduces his local church, and they're there, and then they're there, kind of live, and, he, and, they, and they, they show them, they show the local, you know, they show their church, so it's like just auditorium, slightly smaller than this, all waving at the camera, the image is blurry, yeah, that's the local church, just like struggling with tech, but we're here, we made it, 
We're on telly, everyone. But, you, but you've got this guy on movie week. I fit so well. Uh, on movie week, talking about his faith and his church. You think, well done. That's brilliant. That is wonderful. We can look up to people. We can aspire to follow in the footsteps of others. And maybe many would have done that with John. Oh, that we had that kind of prophetic, challenging voice to the world around us, where we, as the people of God, with the same spirit, are saying, look to him and get right with God. There's a new opportunity. Don't miss it. Oh, wonderful. But let's not make the mistake of just finding an ordinary human who's, and saying, that's, that's my hero. That's the person I'm following. There's an old book by a guy called um, Peter Lewis, used to lead a church in Nottingham. Uh, an amazing book. Um, and he writes at the beginning all about Jesus. He says he was once on holiday. I might have told you this before. And he, he, he went to church on a Sunday. And uh, as, the, as the preacher is nearing the conclusion of his message, leans over the pulpit and says, when I was 12, I, I had a hero. Uh, and this particular hero was a sporting hero who played rugby for the country and cricket for the county or, or something. I mean, a hero, but not like Ronaldo particularly. But then he's maybe not so great, a great a hero. I don't know. Anyway, move on. Um, that was at the age of 12. I had newspaper clippings, you know, I was there thinking, yeah, that was me and Nigel Mansell. You know, the, board, the bedroom was just plastered with Formula One cars. Um, and uh, he was my hero at the age of 12, probably. Um, and then he said, at the age of 14, I got to meet my hero. Because we went, we went fishing in the same place. So I got to spend time with a person I, I really idolized. And he says this, you know, at the age of 14, a bit crestfallen, but the nearer I got to him, the smaller he became. I suppose he, he got to see character flaws, things about him that weren't so amazing. And he said, well, after 35 years of knowing Jesus, the nearer I get to him, the bigger, the bigger he becomes. So, yeah. Life is too short to get really excited about Nigel Mansell winning Formula One races in the 1990s. Life is too short to get really excited about who might win Strictly Come Dancing. Life is too short to be chasing some other hero. Life is to be lived getting closer to Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we're gathered. That's why we're spending time in God's Word. Here is our opportunity to know Him better. And if you've known him for 35 years, he's going to get bigger. You're going to realize more about how awesome he is. Who is your hero? Who are you following? Who do you want to be like? Who do you want to get closer to? John would say of himself, and he's worth getting closer to, I suppose, but John would say later on in this gospel, I, I must become less because it's his time. He must become more. That was the, the testimony of a man who lived fully for God. It's, it's about Jesus getting glory. It's about people following Jesus. That matters more than anything else. What else does a trailer do? A movie trailer will highlight the cliffhanger. This moment of tension. How will it all resolve? And if we watch the trailer, we won't know yet. Because what would be the point of a trailer that gave away the entire plot? You will notice that a two and a half minute trailer is not just the full movie sped up with an expectation that, oh, right, we know what happens now. We don't need to watch it. No, they want you to watch the film. So there'll be a sense of shock Setting the scene, introducing some main characters, and leaving you wondering what, what on earth is going to happen? All, how is all of this going to come together and make sense? And there's something about that which is happening here at the beginning of John's Gospel. 
I mean, it might be a little bit like watching Titanic. You, you know what's coming, okay? We know. Spoiler alert. They kill Jesus, but he rises again three days later, ushering in uh, the kingdom of God um, and a new age for people that who believe in him. But there is that sense of just how, how is this going to resolve? Now you'll notice... Different films, it works in different ways. Let me illustrate by another favorite film. I'm ignoring A-Team this time. I kind of realized afterwards that's just way too niche. They did make a film of the A-Team, but we're not going there. We're going to Paddington. Show of hands, please. Have you seen the film Paddington? Like I said, it's a PG, guys. You're fine. Okay. If you haven't seen the film Paddington, here's what you need to know. There was this lovely bear. Uh, and he travels all the way uh, from Peru. Yes, Peru, we have the flag. Um, all the way from Peru to London in the hope of receiving a warm welcome. And he is just the most special, endearing, wonderful character. But you'll notice this. Often what a film does, the, the, the drama is you know, what, what is the main character in this case, like Paddington or someone else? Um, you know, what, what do they learn and discover about themselves, their own weakness and flaws, and how do they themselves change? Let me put to you that in the film Paddington, the bear doesn't change. He's just gloriously himself. In all these different situations and scenarios, where the drama is, is how will people respond to Paddington? And some people dismiss him. And some people get angry. They want to get that bear. Some people start grumpy or start disillusioned. And then they meet Paddington. Forgive me, just, just go with me for a little bit longer. And they themselves get transformed, and their lives get turned around. The drama here is not what Jesus is going to discover about himself, as though he didn't know his own identity. The drama is what will happen when other people encounter Jesus. And through the gospel, we see these stark and different responses, and I'm not going to introduce them all now, because what would be the point? We've got a whole series for that. But the question is, how will we respond to him? Let me mention another film where I think, um, how, will we remember, how will we respond to him? Actually, the, uh, that's right at the heart, right at the very center of this passage from verse 10. Speaking of him, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He's gone. He's not come from Peru, but he has traveled a huge distance, and he's pitched his tent amongst us. And he's revealing God to us. How will people respond? He would be expecting a welcome because this is the world that he created. But what happened? He polarizes opinion. And the world was made through. He created the world. But the world itself did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. And here's the hint of what's to come. But his own did not receive him. He would be rejected. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, and here is the crux, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. God's plan for your life is that you are born twice. You have your birthday and you remember when you came into the world, but this world is corrupted. It's not a safe place to stay forever. And God wants you, through Jesus, to come into a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth. There is this offer of life, a life that is eternal, a life that is eternal, but we have revealed to us and can walk in right now. God wants us to have a new life, and that's why he sent Jesus. And there is this amazing offer then to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name. And John will wrap up his gospel with a similar encouragement in John chapter 20. 
and verse 30. He gets to, right to the end and he says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Like John is saying, here's just a few things that he did that were amazing. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. True life, real life, ultimate life, not always easy life. If Jesus wouldn't be received by his own, you won't be received. You will experience some rejection and suffering by, by following Jesus. The road won't be easy, but the road will be good. And what do we encounter in this Jesus it says, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. What blessing is he talking about? Well, he's saying, well, the law that was given through Moses, that was a blessing. God blessed his people. God rescued them out of Israel. God said, you're mine. I've chosen you. Not because you're special, but I'm making you special. Because I love you. I'm going to reveal myself to you. And I'm going to do that through the law through the first five books of the Bible. I'm going to reveal myself to you. This is how you can know me. That was a blessing. But then another, even greater blessing comes, for grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And now we're going to go through this series and we're going to see what grace and truth look like in what Jesus did and what he said. who would reveal a God of just ridiculous kindness and blessing and goodness. This massive story then that we are invited to become a part of by believing in his name. See the signs. Listen to the people who are saying, look to Jesus. See what he did. See what he said. And put your faith in him because he's alive and living uh, right now. Let me mention one more film uh, before the band come back up. Uh, the film Do The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Yes! Fist pumps from the second row. Um, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Again, you're forgiven if you've not watched it, but it's one of the stories that belong in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Narnia, this other world, like this parallel universe that a different combination of children visit in remarkable ways. And in this world you hear about Jesus, in that world you hear about a lion called Aslan, who was there and who created Narnia, who just like breathed out life all over Narnia. A lion who would allow himself to be killed, but rise later to save those of us who've sinned and turned against him. And in the film, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there are three children, and they're going, to re they're going to visit Narnia again. They don't go through the back of the wardrobe this time. They're in a room, and on the wall of the room is a picture of a boat on the wall. And they, the three of them, Edmund and Lucy, they have been to Narnia before. They have already met Aslan. They know it's real. And Eustace, who doesn't know that yet. And they're looking at the picture on the wall and talking about whether they like the picture or not. It's of a boat on some raging seas. And as they look at the picture, something crazy happens. Now, let me just point out, I'm talking now about the book, not the film. Okay? It's one of those classic examples where the book is better than the film. They had to change it for the film, read the book. So in the book, they're looking at the picture, and suddenly, a splash of the waves comes from the picture out at them. It looks like the water is moving. The boat is rising and surging, and this is freaky. You'd be allowed to be freaked out at this moment if this was happening in your bedroom. It's just a picture on the wall, but it's alive. And now they're, they're kind of arguing. Um, Eustace thinks that the other kids are playing a trick on him. This is unkind. And he steps forward 
to take the picture off the wall and throw it on the ground. But as he steps forward, he realizes he stood on the picture frame. He's now in the picture, looking at the water in the boat and looking back at the bedroom. And the bedroom grows and gets bigger. And all three children go into this new world, this new life. I think that's what John in his trailer wants for us. I don't know what you have seen of Jesus before. I don't know what you've heard about him. I don't know if you like the portraits that you have in your mind about Jesus. I don't know how you piece that together, whether it was through uh, 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 being part of a church that was, that was uh, kind of oppressive or dry or crusty or whatever, or, or some difficult experiences. I don't know if it's a total mystery to you. Met people before have said, I, when I, before I came to Jesus, I, I had no, I, I had nothing to go on. I wasn't raised reading the Bible, going to church, anything. Complete non-Christian, unchristian, de-Christianized life. And then I met Jesus. And that was interesting. I, I don't know. It might feel like being useless. You feel like someone's playing a trick on you, a kind of confidence trick. Why? You're setting me up. I don't like it. But through John's gospel and through God's word, you can suddenly find yourself stood in the picture, realizing we're not just having a discussion about information. We're not just reading words from a page, working out what we like and what we don't like about the portrait. John is giving us a way of coming to faith in Jesus and having life in his name, a whole new life where you will see things differently and you will know God. You will know Jesus. And maybe before we wrap up, it's a bit like being Edmund and Lucy. You know. You've been there before. In that sense, you believe. But maybe it's a while since you visited Narnia. Maybe it's a while since when you opened up the pages of the Bible, you were expecting to encounter a living God who wants to shape your entire world by what his word says. Has your faith just become a picture on the wall? And maybe you still really like the picture. And maybe you can talk about it. And maybe you can remember those times when, once upon a time. Oh, do you remember when? When God was doing things. No, is that, is that what it's become? Because perhaps like Edmund and Lucy, it's about time we expected to have a fresh encounter with God in his word. Now, today, this week, where you say, oh Lord, I believe, but I'm coming to you afresh. That is my encouragement for us as a whole community through looking at John. Forgive me. Let the band come up. We're going to worship God together. But I hope this does something to whet your appetite to encounter God in the Word. Let's allow him to turn our lives upside down. I'm going to pray and we'll worship.